Welcome to Rinish's Paintbrush. Today we're going to talk about painting up a long fang captain with a rocket launcher. Alrighty, welcome back. Today we're going to do the Space Wolves Long Fan. This is a new project for my Space Wolves army, which is great. I mean, I need long distance pew pew. In other words, a lot of firepower because I've been getting nailed by these things called Hell Blasters, which are from Ultramar. These Ultramarines, Hell Blasters, with plasma weapons that can reach really far and can do a ton of damage. So I need to return the favor. This squad is equivalent to the Devastator squads for the Ultramarines. That means all the heaviest weapons come in packed in this beautiful, beautifully laid out uh, kit which is really great now I do know with these kits a lot of people have been saying that they're going to do away with them slowly but surely and then finally phase in an all Primaris army quite frankly these this kit is well a little dated but really cool like I really enjoyed putting together this kit but it is an old kit and the pieces well some of them fit okay the other ones gave me struggles especially with the two shoulders while they're hoping holding a weapon if anybody knows uh, about these ultramarines uh, kits they'll know that whenever they're holding two weapons the shoulders each arm has to be contacted correctly on the on their body while holding the weapon itself and sometimes those pieces don't really align up very well so you need to be cautious of that now whether we're going to all space um, Mar primaris marines or regular marines it doesn't matter because to me I like them both okay with this model here I wanted to do something a little different right, since he was the captain I wanted to give him a special shoulder pad what I did so I got this upgrade kit and that's what I did I just swapped in a shoulder okay so next up what we're going to do is we're going to spray primer all the pieces now I am going to batch paint uh, or batch I guess base coat all the long fangs which you're going to see in subsequent videos I am intending to do one long fang for the captain holding an RPG and two long fangs with um, LAS cannons and two with uh, plasma, um, what are they, plasma cannons. That's it. <laughs> All right, so we're going to base coat it with, uh, what is it? cold gray and then we're going to go into uh, foundation white and we're going to build up the highlights and you can see uh, using this that I'm actually base coating or um, yeah just base coating all my uh, ultramarines all the long fangs the entire project to get that out of the way because once you have the base coat you can play around with you know playing around with transitions or playing around with this detail and getting that in and that's a lot of fun for me so I kind of want to just get into the transitions of the base coat and get a solid base coat for all these models and I do the same base coat with all my um, all my space wolves I have a video about base coating them, but I'm going to show you the process here. So, all these pieces, I mean, once you put them together, whoops, <laughs> I'm a little clumsy. I don't know how I got into painting all this if I'm so clumsy, but you know, that made it happen. Well, you can see these are spot highlights, which you do with the white and kind of just bring it up. So what you have is grays, you have blacks and you have white so far. Okay, going on to the head. 
I chose this basic skin tone. You can use any skin tone you'd like. It's Zenithyl highlighted. So what I did was use glaze medium with the skin color that I chose. And I just put a little glaze coat on top of it. Now you want to retain all the shadows that are there. They're there already. If you cover up the shadows, there's no point in Zenithyl highlighting. So you just want to glaze those colors in and give that tr automatic transition. And now that the, the shadows are black and they may be black but you're going to add different color variations to it later on and glazing in some more colors but for now what you have is a highlighted face that's trying to get ahead on there highlighted face with a transition of shadows going down to the bottom and there you go base coating for that all right next up i use a heavy blue gray and this is going to be an all over uh coat and it's going to be just very heavily glazed and almost like fat glazing I guess and um, it's going to be heavily heavily glazed and it's just light all over coat just to even it up you see you have a stark transition from the white going down into the gray into the black and you kind of just want to put a mid-tone and now this is werewolf gray from Minotaur and that is that light blue color you're going to see for all my um, space wolves and I, I think it works really, I mean, it is an amazing uh, combination. I like the color. At first I was like, maybe not light blue, maybe I should go darker gray, but no, I, I kind of like it. Uh, it's that wolven gray, it's that, you know, um, I guess just running with the pack. It just makes me feel like that. Okay, some bootstrap leather is next. And what I'm going to do with this boot, bootstrap leather is I'm going to paint the leather surroundings for the pelt that is uh, covering his loincloth, if you will. And I get into details with that and really just base coat it slowly but surely, bringing up the colors. And you need to take your time with these things. Taking time with and enjoying every different stroke, learning the paints and learning how to manipulate the paints is part of the painting process. I know that all kinds of paints have a different consistency and when you're pushing paint around, you kind of learn how each paint works. So I use the P3s, I use Vallejo, I use just about anything under the sun, Citadel, you name it. Now, uh, I wouldn't use craft paints uh, only because the pigments are too large. So when you water it down to, down to do glazes and slowly bring up transition, it might cause an issue. So you may not want to do that. But taking your time definitely and building up your paint with uh, the appropriate miniature paints is how you get those beautiful, beautiful transitions. So today I'm going to do doing the long things. Some space wolves are indomitable enough to endure centuries of active service in the name of the Allfather. Their individual sagas are long and filled with bloody deeds, and each has earned wisdom and insight from innumerable battlefields. These packs of veteran space wolves are known as the Long Fangs. Their temperament is undying, their aim unshakable. The discipline and determination of these venerable warriors is a legend, and they are entrusted with the supporting their brethren in battle by utilizing the heaviest weaponry found within the armories of the Fang. The Long Fang say that they know every soul of every weapon in the armories of the Iron Priest, and will take every opportunity to prove it in battle. These guys that I'm painting up here. They're no joke. They've seen battle for so many years, they've actually lived to grow old, which is not really as common as you might think. So that's why I take great pride in painting these long fangs because of their history, because of their being VA, because they're going to take down those hell blasters. At least I hope so. All right, I'm going to put in a dark brown. Now, I use charred brown from Vallejo, but you can use any dark brown. And what I do is, is I coat every area that I'm going to paint gold with that rich dark brown because I really want a rich dark 
gold. Now, if you wanted a paler gold, I would undercoat it with a light, maybe a bootstrap leather or something even lighter than that. Uh, all the way up to bone if you want the lightest, um, brightest gold. But I like that rich, rich, deep gold. I think it adds a lot of contrast with the blue armor. The blues and the, well, essentially the yellows, uh, they're pretty much complementary. It's like blue, red, and that spectrum. And that's why uh, these blue uh, Space Wolves have yellow shoulder pads uh, because it has that contrasting colors because they have gold which is essentially yellow as well so it's blue and gold which are perfect combination for colors and it's very very pleasing to the eye in order to do so i usually base coat all my gold with a dark brown to bring up that tone and while i'm doing that i do want to talk a little bit about the history of the sons of russ one of the biggest battles that they had was Prospero. Prospero is their mortal energy. Well, not enemy. The, not the actual planet itself, but the Thousand Suns Legion. It was told uh, that Lehman Ross must attack the Thousand Suns for heresy. The Space Wolves, in fact, were pivotal in one of the earlier campaigns of the war. When the entire Legion attacked and devastated the Thousand Suns, Space Marines on their homeworld, Prospero. At the battle's height, Lehman Russ, that is the Primarch of the Space Wolves, fought the Primarch of the Thousand Suns, the Cyclopean giant Magnus the Red, in personal combat. Though Magnus was a psyker of terrible magnitude, he could not withstand the strength and ferocity of the Wolf King. After a short but fierce duel, Russ struck Magnus down. Though the Prosperine sorcerer used fell magics to escape before Russ could ever deliver the killing blow. With the loss of their Primarch, the Thousand Sons faced annihilation. In their desperation, they fled the field of the battle through a portal that led into the dynamic, into the demonic realm known as the Eye of Terror. It was whilst pursuing the Thousand Sons the Space Wolves lost the 13th Company. These ferocious warriors, their ranks were riddled with bestial genetic curse known as the Wolf in Kind. Since its loss that day, the Space Wolves have never again had a 13th Company, nor has any Wolf Lord borne the badge of the Wolf in. So, Prospero was completely dis dis destroyed in the Space Wolves. And if you've ever seen the game, The Burning of Prospero, you actually have that Wolf Legion uh, attacking uh, uh, attacking Prospero. And that's what that game is all about. So if you're into 30k uh, instead of 40k, which is what this is, which is just 10,000 years earlier in the history of that, you can actually pick up that box set at GW. Although, there's been a lot of things happening at, uh, at Games Workshop, well, actually, at Forge World, when it comes to, you know, last chance to buy. So, I'm kind of leery about, you know, their their 30k stuff, because, you know, if it's last chance to buy, maybe they're just going to make either new stuff, or maybe 30k is going somewhere, you know? Maybe their sales are just down. Who knows? All right, just conjecture there. Speaking of new things, and I know this is 40k, but you know, and I know that there is a future for the Space Wolves because this summer it has been said that Lehman Russ, the Primarch of the Space Wolves, might make a return. And I am so ecstatic about that. Also, the Space Wolves will get a codex. Now, I've been playing with the index. And there are other people like playing against custodes and um, custodians, which are the personal guard for the emperor, and they're bathing clothes, um, gold, and they are supposed to be of sterner stuff than just the regular adeptis astartes. Um, and they are kicking my butt, but they have stratagems. And then um, I played against. Um, Caliban, the green dudes. Oh, gosh, I've forgotten. 
Oh, hold on. Time for mummy. I'm going to do some mummy color on this now. Um, I believe I'm going some some highlights for that leather. Uh, and I want to just do the fur as well and just bring a transition to that. Um, I'm starting with that mummy. And while I do that, I'll continue. So, yeah, every time I play it, because I've been playing recently, I've been getting my butt handed, with, handed to me because of the stratagems that come with each codex that is released. And for those that don't know, codex is a book uh, giving you a lot of more. I mean, giving you the points or read points or adjustments for your army, as well as the scores and... Um, uh, their values and you know, their attacks if anything was tweaked or anything like that it'll all come in a book and in that book you also have these stratagems that your army can use uh, within the game now that changes um, the way your army plays in not in game style but giving you a lot more opportunity to do a lot more damage and to be more effective on the battlefield so a codex on the Space Wolf is going to drop soon, and I'm just very curious to see what they do. Um, some relic weapons would be cool. I want to see the new models. I am super excited about the new models. And in fact, you've been noticing, or you should have been noticing on my channel, I've been doing a lot of Space Wolves. Now, Space Wolves aren't my only army. I do have a Tau army as well, and they're on Sprue. <laughs> that means I will not use it because I will not field an unpainted model. That's just a rule I have for myself. Um, but yeah, they're on Sprue, but I also have Age of Sigmar. Um, I have uh, several kits from Shadespire, which I enjoy playing as well. And I play with a couple of peoples, my peeps, and uh, it's a lot of fun to play. The card mechanic is interesting. And then I have Age of Sigmar, which I am really trying to um, be a force of, um, I guess, starting something large with Age of Sigmar at my uh, local gaming store. And uh, yeah, really, really trying to set something off and, and set a passion because I have a death army and very soon, very soon, I believe there's going to be a starter box, AOS 2, and I'm going to have night haunts. And if you didn't know, uh, in the intro of this video, you can see that I the only um aos stuff that i've painted so far out of many 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 kits are the malignants which are the night haunt clan so night haunt is supposed to get their own codex and they're supposed to be a, a release of um aos 2.0 i guess and with that they're going to have um, I believe it's all conjecture because I don't know just yet, but I think it's Night Haunt versus Stormcast. Now, I do have a Stormcast army and I have a Night Haunt army. Uh, well, um, I should say I have a Death Legions of Nagash army as well as, um, let me see, the Flesh Eater Courts. And I do have that battle um, force that I got released with Neferata in it this uh, Christmas. I picked up that and uh, Skeleton Horde starter box and like that. There's so many. I have a lot of death faction stuff and it's a good time to be with the malign portents and everything else going on. It's a good time to be a death player. Um, but with that being said, and I am super excited to go out and paint as much death faction stuff as I possibly can. But at the moment, I'm putting together Space Wolves. And you may ask yourself, why? Well, I mean, for me, it's kind of simple. If there are going to be a boatload of Primaris Marines, right? Then my motivation to paint the little guys, that's what I'm going to call them there, the little guys. And these guys here, here, since the Primaris Marines are taller, if you didn't know, um, it gives me more motivation to paint them now because later on I want to paint the Primaris and I'm eventually going to go straight to the Primaris only but I do have all these kits that I really want to put together and really make come alive and I do enjoy painting the Space Wolves that I have um, I do um, elevate the height of these Space Wolves in fact I use a little bit of caulk uh, on the base to have a, cin a cinematic kind of base going on um, but at the same time, I'm raising the height of these space marines so it can be equivalent 
to the height of the Primaris Marines when I put them on a flat base. And that's going to be interesting because I'm going to put them on a flat, the uh, Primaris Marines on flat bases while these are elevated. In other words, when I field them all together, when I field them all together, uh, they're all going to look the same height. So I, I touched stuff up with black. Now I'm going with the bone white. And going into the blown white, I mean, no, no surprise there. It's one of my most used colors, uh, bone white. I do like that that reddish white, that darkish white, you know, that warm white, I'd say, uh, color for the tips. But there are other colors that I can use. I just really enjoy that color. And I'm going to do the tips of the fur to create a gradient. And I'll later on bring it all together with a wash. So as I was saying, I do have um, plenty of death faction and I want to paint those. And since I want, I have these uh, little guys over here, as far as the painting cue is concerned, I do want to paint all these guys so this way I can just concentrate on the Primera stuff that I'll be uh, picking up when the new edition, or I guess the, the Codex drops with a whole bunch of stuff. Now I wonder if they're going to do another Battle Force this uh, holiday season on the Space Wolves. Now my my start with the Space Wolves and 40k period was I picked up the Battle Force box for the Space Wolves, <laughs> in which I got uh, you know Stormfang and a whole bunch of other stuff. And in doing that, I fell in love with this faction, you know, and that just grew and grew, and, and more and more things came my way, and. Um, it was it was really it was like love at first sight when I came and saw that battle box and I saw that storm fang and it's like a plane oh my goodness that's insane you know I was gonna get another uh, AOS faction but I you know I'm glad that I didn't I was I was going to get some tree folk some Sylvaneth but I didn't all right it's time for some fist and red um, I guess I'm gonna paint that purity sail and then. Um, I didn't, and I'm glad that I didn't. Although, that being said, that was an amazing box set. You know, the Sylvanath, the Battle Force box set was an amazing box set. And I could be all over that, you know, all over it. Because, I mean, it's Sylvanath, and you have so many things that you'd have got. I mean, I would have started my army right there. Now, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't pick up Sylvanath 1, because uh, to pack them up, into uh, foam and carry them are a bit of a nightmare because of all the spiky bits. And also, but one thing I do regret is not getting, you know, the Ever Queen on the Big Beetle because that would have been a cool model to uh, paint up. Uh, and I guess, I guess I could still get it without getting the army and uh, do her up for a competition. You know that Beetle's tag? I was thinking about um, Green Stuff Worlds have this color chameleon paint. They're painting it up as a, um, a Japanese beetle. With that, that, I would think that would be cool. <laughs> All right, time to panel line washes. And I use Vallejo wash right there uh, for darker vehicles, it says, but I use it in combination with a little bit of paint and a lot of bit of water <laughs> so I can flow easily. And I just line detail everything. And this I've been doing because a lot of people have been mentioning in my videos that some of the space wolves, I'm not space wolves, some of my models in general that that I, they can benefit from a wash because the, the lines, the contrast of the lines aren't there. So this method I want to use and this way I can bring up that contrast. So each way each panel line is actually sectioned out. And I'm learning this brush control here. Um, and it's a great thing because I could then in turn switch that over to like stormtroopers, but definitely when I tackle the Tau. Uh, Tau army is more like an anime kind of army where they have all these suits and the suits will definitely benefit from panel lining. Um, I don't want to watch the whole thing because I don't want to lose the detail that I just put into it. Like I can't see just throwing some wash on there and darkening everything down, especially when I had spot highlighting and the contrast is so high. I want to keep the contrast high. If you want your miniatures to get noticed, you need to up the contrast. Contrast is what is the pow. Like you come up and you say, oh my gosh, that is a beautiful miniature. And why would you say that? Because you can notice it from across the room. And how can you notice it from across the room? Is because the contrast is there. It is level 20 and that's where you want your miniatures you want your miniatures to get noticed you put all this work into it you want it to be noticed so 
I don't want to bring all that down by putting a wash onto it. You know, Duncan is great and he's an amazing artist and all those painters, heavy metal team is absolutely amazing. And um, I just, my personal style, I don't like just throwing washes on things and like obliterating some detail because, well, I was being lazy. For that, I would rather pen a line and line every single detail that is in there. And actually, I'm enjoying myself. And, you know, if you have 50 of these to do, it's all you have 50 of them to do. Um, you know, uh, you don't want to do them unless you're painting for a tournament and that's your thing. Um, I refuse to paint to a lower standard because I'm in a rush. I'm not in a rush. I have my whole life. I'm enjoying the models that I do paint up, and when I feel them, I'm very proud of them. Whether they do well or not, I'm just very proud of them. And I believe that, you know, if you go going up the, uh, well, Agrax are shade now, I'm going to darken in the pelt. But I believe that if you're going for a uh, competition, then who cares what the models kind of paint it like? But if you uh, like the artistic side of it, then yeah, it's going to matter to you. It's gonna be a, it's gonna make a difference. So you gonna want to paint it, and I will not, will not, will not lower my standards of painting because of a, a tournament or, or a competition or, or playing. I'm not. I am going to enjoy this hobby, and I'm not gonna compromise my enjoyment of the hobby. My enjoyment of the hobby, yeah, it feels good when you stomp on somebody, and, and because of your actions as a general, led you to a victory within the game. That's fun. Um, knocking somebody out and stomping them and then like, haha, in their face. That's like even a form of bullying, I guess. I mean, win, but you don't have to like rub it into people's faces. And the reason why I say this is because if you start, you know, pummeling people and poo pooing on their, their Cheerios and, and, you know, crushing them completely, what makes you think they're going to want to play the game? They're not having fun. All right, here is a mixture of uh, pale burnt metal. We have some copper and some gold. I'm just playing around with these. When you have metallic paints, you can play around with them and come up with your own color. Look how rich that gold is. It's like old gold rich. Like almost like pink gold, if you will. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. And I'm gonna go over a bits and bobs with this. Um, I did a non-metallic metal, non-metallic metal with my, um, uh, wolf, I'm sorry, my blood claws, and you know it took me, oh my gosh, better part, better part of a year in order to get those blood claws done, and those are 15 models, and yeah, it took me forever, and and from there I just wanted to force myself to learn non-metallic metal and how it works and how to push paint around, and still, I mean, I need to work on it, but I did not want to work on it anymore when it comes to my space wolves. I just, I was done, you know, I'm done. I'll, I'll work on it with something else. Um, so I just went in and, and uh, started just doing metallic metals, uh, TMM, true metallic metals, instead of NMM, which is non-metallic metals. And um, I mean, it is a time saver. Um, you still have to put in the the shadows where the shadows need to be and bring up the highlights now i highlight it with like a silver or pale burnt silver and then i can glaze it with ink and the reason why i glaze over metallic metal with inks is because inks are very reflective they're shiny you can wash metallic metals but it really dulls down that shine and if you want something to shine you can't get rid of the shine. They do have gloss washes, but to me, that really doesn't shine as much as I want it to. I wanted the metal, metallic metals to really pop. And in order to really pop, you, you never get rid of the shine, you know, to begin with. You don't dull it down at all. You, you make it glossy. You make it glossy. So, and that's exactly what I do uh, with inks, because inks are super high gloss. Inks are super high pigmented as well so i mean you only have to do is mix it with water in order to get a glaze which i love you know i use a uh, ronald dowley dowley fw inks a lot and i really like their inks as well and uh, it's really awesome to do 
batch highlighting with them. And it's awesome to do uh, laces with them as well. And you're gonna have to mix some of the inks together in order to get the color you want. So having the consistency of color throughout the entire army is, can be a little tricky. Um, I would write a note journal and seeing exactly what it is that you have. So this way, you, know, you don't have to, you can recreate what you had in a formula and get that same color throughout the army again. I do have a recipe book and it is on my phone currently. So whenever I want to refer to, including, you know, my base coding for my space walls, including um, everything they're done, like um, bone recipes and all kind of recipes that I get and that I tried and that worked for me, then I just write it down into my notepad in my phone. And then I have it for, there for ref reference if I ever need to go back. Excuse me. All right. Um, so, yep, I'm getting all the gold pieces. Notice how my finger is on the actual pill bottle. Now, I do have those Citadel uh, grippers, but I tend not to use them as much as I thought I would. You know, I use them. I used them when I was building Shadespire, and the uh, I couldn't do it in too many simple assemblies, and I had to do the base. So... When I did that base, I uh, spray painted it and whatnot, and I hand painted it, but I hand painted it onto uh, that holder, that set of that holder. So I don't really use it to spray on. I don't, I don't spray on the holder itself. Like I'll spray on the pill bottle because that gets messed up and it's a pill bottle. But this, the other thing is, you know, it costs money, so I don't want to ruin it. So getting all the gold pieces are pretty cool. Um, I really try to get into the line and it's really, see how long it takes me to do that. I'm just being very careful and you can see the brush strokes are very slight as I go around, but the result is so worth it. You take your time in doing these and getting them, especially with metallics because metallics, um, don't really wipe off very well. They don't like to play nicely if you make mistakes. So you take your time with it and slowly do the colors, little strokes, it's all it is, little strokes. And know that whatever brush you're using, it slowly you'll start ruining it because there are metal flakes in here and metal flakes on hair brushes. Throw metal in your hair, it's not a great combination, so you gotta watch that. Alrighty, so we're gonna go with some Serapon Sepia. And we're gonna unify uh, all that pelt in the front. So we had Agrax Earthshade, we had uh, Burnt Pale Burnt Brown, and now for the Agrax Earthshade, uh, I mean for the Serapon Sepia all the way throughout, uh, giving that tonal variation. So this can be done without an airbrush. I mean, everything, there's nothing new under the sun. All that I do with an airbrush are the same techniques that you can do with a regular brush. It just saves a lot of time, and I don't want to waste my time, so I, know, I like using an airbrush. And it's worth the investment, that's for sure. Some people have a problem because it's a little bit of expensive, but honestly, it's worth the investment. And the little bit that you put in now will make your hobbying life so much richer and better, so why not do it? That's what I say. So here's a pelt in the front, and now I do a different pelt in the back. On his back, I try it with airbrush, so you can see the results of both. And they're both on the same model, so it's interesting to see both an airbrushed pelt and a handbrushed pelt side by side, so this way you can actually make a comparison between the two and see which one you like better. Whichever you like better, you stick with, that's for sure. Um, but this is sort of a test in building that model and painting it in different ways. Fur versus airbrush versus paintbrush. All right, here I have a Macron pen and I'm going to do the lettering of the purity seal. And as you can see, it's a, pen, a Micron pen and it's a 0 0.005 tip. So that's super small. And I'm gonna do this little rays little marks going through but only because the lettering at that size and scale you would really not be able to recognize so just going across doing little hash marks and that is good enough to do a purity seal going down line by line uh each part of the purity seal gets a little bit of writing on it do not neglect any portion of it and have it complete so you can see it comes out really well maybe if i zoom in a little bit 
Yeah, you can see it a little better. Let me get the uh, focus and range, and there you go. So as you can see, it looks really great. I really like it anyway. All right, so time for some mummer. This is gonna be the airbrush pelt, so you can see a difference between the airbrush pelt and the paint, hand-painted pelt, uh, bringing up tonal variations. Again, starting out with money, mummy as a base coat, you can see how much quicker it is. Now, at the same time, you don't just get an airbrush and it paints itself. I mean, there's a trick to it. There's a learning curve to it, like everything else. And you're gonna have to take that into consideration when you get yourself an airbrush. If there is a learning curve, you will mess up and probably uh, cuss at something. And you probably wanna give up for a little while until you actually get it. Now, no one really taught me how to use an airbrush. So I put up some advice on how to use an airbrush on my channel and I uh, have several tips and tricks that you can have to do with the airbrush. And I learned them all the hard way. That's right, the hard way. All because, well, I don't know. I guess I'm a little stubborn. And uh, I figured I could figure it out by myself without asking for any help. Too many people solicit a lot of information and not all the information is accurate, which makes me nervous because if I'm gonna attempt something, I want the information to be accurate and me to be sure of what I'm going to attempt before I attempt it. But certainty, certainty comes at a price, and that is for certain. Good thing I'm going to go to the Nova Opium this year, and while I go to the Nova Open this year, I have signed up for several painting classes in order to try to perfect my painting. One thing I want to work on is my freehand. I want to be able to do banners that are shocking and so show-stopping, and to be able to do uh, freehand on my uh, Night Titan, Night Warden, and be able to just get it done and really have a really, really beautiful piece uh, on my miniature that I painted myself, a uh, nice freehand work. So it's kind of tough for me, so I'm glad I have that. Yep, okay, uh, time for some charred, burnt, is it? it's a uh, charred brown, I'm sorry. For some charred brown, and I'm gonna bring up the edges of charred brown from Mummy. Just bringing up the tip. You see I'm just gently rocking back on the airbrush just to bring that brown in. Yep. Again, this process is just sped up. It's sped up because, you know, I, um, if I'm going to hand brush this, it'll take me several hours. As to doing it, this method, which takes a very, very short amount of time, several minutes, in order to get done. Minutes versus hours that I can get on and start painting something instead of having something that I need to get painted. And I have so many models to get done. There's like no way I'm actually going to get through, through them all unless I just airbrush and get through them all. Alrighty, next up here, bone white, big surprise, dun, 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 bone white. Then I'm gonna go in the lower edges and the tip, and this is pretty much what I do all my fur pelts in. I like that brown pelt. I haven't done a gray pelt yet. Uh, maybe I'll just play around with that in future videos. Not sure how to get to that, um, but I'll play around with it and see how it works. Really, really enjoy spraying this pelt. Now, for masking, I use Silly Putty, uh, to just mask off the top of the pelt uh, simply because, you know, I want the backpack to show and all that and I want it to get out in the way or anything like that. So, you know, you had to mask that place off and Silly Putty fits and conforms to just about any size. So this way you can mask things like that. So gently pulling on the trigger and you can see the tonal variation occur. You can see the blends occur. I love it. I lo look how subtle that is. That is beautifully gorgeous. Absolutely beautifully gorgeous. And I love the richness of it. I love using airbrush and I love getting that effect. Yep, just about done with that. And I think it came out amazing. Alrighty, so look at that pelt. I took off the silly putty and now I'm going to mount it onto the top. And the pelt came with the actual torso. They're put together in one piece and that's how they come. So I'm gonna put a little glue on it 
And then, oh wait, I gotta get all the poster tack out of it before I put a little glue on it. So I remove all the glue. Now you wanna remove all the poster tack because you don't wanna glue the poster tack in there because the contact points between the poster tacks are not really gonna get glued. You know, so you gotta remove all that stuff and all the junk or debris that you have in two connecting points before you actually connect them. And there it is, it's connected. And then I thought about it and said, well, I mean, that's kind of tough. What if it fell apart? So then I stood it up and there you go. <laughs> there you go. I think I filled with it just a little bit and uh, it works. So I'm digging it. Pretty cool. Yeah. So pieces went together pretty well at this point. No complaints whatsoever. The stuff that I'm going to talk about later is what uh, will give me a hard time. So, speaking about um, the Primark, I do want to just tickle it with something. Time for some Memphis and Red. I'm going to put those on the tips of the nails and some glaze meaning and glaze that in. Speaking about Lehman Russ, Lehman Russ from the Space Wolf had disappeared. No one knows whatever happened to Lehman Russ. Some say he disappeared in the Eye of Terror whilst searching for his old friend and rival, the Primarch Lionel Johnson. Others say that to this day he walks disguised among mankind, watching over the people of his emperor and guarding them from the powers of chaos. All that is known for sure is that Lehman Russ vanished on the feast of the Emperor's Ascension almost 200 years after the Emperor was entombed in the Golden Throne. It is said that the eyes glazed over and that he had a look of a man who was overcome by a vision. He rose from the great table, he put down his drinking horn and summoned his most favored retainers. Of these only Bjorn the Fell-Handed, youngest of the Rust's wolf guard, uh, was left behind. No one knows whether Russ no one knows where Russ has gone. The Space Wolves waited for his return. Every year his place was laid at the feast table, and every year his great drinking horn was filled in case he should return. The years slunk past, and he did not come. After seven years, the surviving wolf lords gathered the elected Bjorn as their leader, awarding him the great title of Great Wolf. Bjorn gathered all his warriors together in the Hall of the Fang and announced the first great hunt. Russ's people would seek out their master if it looked if it took the rest of their time to do it. So did the twelve great companies take on their ships and sail forth in separate directions across the sea of stars. The tale of their deeds is too long to recount. In full save on all winter's eve. When the room priests gather to chant the sagas, they sought Russ on many worlds and in many places. They fought intense battles against aliens and overcame void spawn and raging demon alike. The space wolves hunted in this dimension and in the next, but the Russ, but of Russ. They found no sign, until eventually they were recalled to Fenris, bearing naught but tales of their adventures. Thus the first great hunt ended in failure. Alright, time to put on some ivory on this coat here. Yeah, now that's just for the fingertips, for the claws actually. Since that day, there have been many other great hunts on occasion. Russ had appeared to the great wolf or rune priest in a vision and told him, it is time. These periods 
of daring deeds and high adventure when the chapter takes this takes to the sea of stars and seek their lost leader although they have never successful they have never been successful in their goal each great hunt has struck a decisive blow against the enemies of mankind and the second great hunt led to the recovery of an artifact believed to be the armor of Russ. The fourth uncovered the Karelian conspiracy and foiled its efforts to overthrow the administratum in bloody coup. The ninth great hunt led to the destruction of the gene stealer infested worlds of Gana system, whilst the 13th saw the annihilation of a warband of traitor space marines, the Lost. It would seem that whenever the spirit of Russ appears to his people, he has some mighty tasks for them. Who knows what or when the next one will be. But Russ coming back, I wonder where he's been. I wonder what he's seen. I wonder why it's now that he decides to come back. Who knows? I think it's amazing the story of this epic saga of the space world is coming to a crescendo to reinvigor the troops. One thing that I'm worried about is the story between the Primaris Marines and the Space Wolves. And we all know the Space Wolves, what well, we should know, Space Wolves have an attitude problem. And they're wolves, for crying out loud. So of course they have attitude problems. And they don't really try, try to follow the rules of everybody else. They kick butt. It's what they do. Um, so having Primaris Marines people that were not born from Fenris, their home death world, and coming in, there's bound to be problems, right? Well, how I view this is that the Space Wolves, the ones born from Fenris, were actually considered above the Primaris. They make it known. They make it known that they are better in all ways because they've proven themselves. And in order to prove yourself, you have to do a lot of different deeds. And I would think on, you know, nights of drinking the Great Horn that, <laughs> the Great Hall, and having a Great Horn filled uh, with mead and root beer, that eventually they would earn the right to be part of them, the wolves. But they're gonna have to prove themselves. And until they prove themselves, they're pretty much, you know, the gophers. Go get me some more of this, or get me some of that. And they are primaris after all though. So it won't take them too long to prove themselves. And some have. Those are the ones that actually made it into the army. Now these wolves come from that planet Fenris, and they're very proud of their of their uh, home world. It is their proving ground. It's where they draw their people from, and only the sturdiest people come from there because it's a death world. It is no place to live and thrive in. There is no like. I don't think there's any farming there. You just have to fish. I mean, that's pretty much it. And it's constantly freezing, and there's constant storms and big things lurking to kill you. It's not a friendly place. All right, time for some dark aluminum on this highlights on the backpack. We're gonna hit that off. There is some mythology around Fenris. The warriors of Fenris are raised on tales of monsters and heroes, sky straddling wolves and worlds spanning sea beasts. They have a proud tradition of storytelling and value a good tale almost as much is a good fight. The mythology of Fenris is crowded with the deeds of heroes, and many of these tales feature the legendary wolves of Fenris. Primaris have a lot to look up to, and well, a lot to earn up to. 
to become a hero of Fenris. And they need to do that in order to become a true member of the chapter. They need to prove themselves. According to the ancient legend, Lehman Russ fought and tamed the great wolf packs of Ashaheen. And he cast down the two-headed wolf god, Marakai, and made him the guardian of the gates of death, a task that Marathai had endured ever since. Russ then fought Marakai's lieutenants, banishing each in turn to the appointed place. The most fearsome was Blackmane, the terrifying ebon furred creature whose long howling cry would call the souls of the dead warriors from their graves. Russ challenged Blackmane and slew him, making his pelt into a magic cloak that allowed him to pass into the realm of the dead. These beliefs are looked upon with scorn by the ecclesiarchy, but the sons of Russ refuse to give up their traditions, even when their fangs are long. Superstition is rife amongst the space wolves, and their entire battle they enter battle festooned with totems and talismans to bring luck and ward off evil spirits. Reserved above all are Lehman Russ and the Emperor, whom they call the Allfather. All right. Time to put on some charred brown. I'm going to paint up the, uh, the skeleton on the, black, the backpack as well. They look upon Russ as more than a man and attribute him to the deeds of a god. Heroes are held in the highest esteem and none more than their Primarch, who they believe will return to fight with them at the end of all things for the wolf time. Quite a legacy to look up to. Quite a legacy for the Primarchs, for the Primaris Marines to actually look up to. You know. In order to be a hero, you gotta be the best darn hero around and with all the legacy things. All the legacy of the spell Space Wolves is kinda hard for me to imagine Primaris just leaking in there, so I really have a hard time. So I would think that they would have to prove themselves. And in order to prove themselves, they would have to do some pretty, pretty, pretty nasty deeds. Uh, <laughs> they have to be true heroes and stout warriors. Or if not, they'll remain like a blood claw, maybe. I don't even know. Maybe the blood claws would be insulted by them. Because you, even as a blood claw, you have to do amazing deeds in order to get anywhere. Okay, time for the head. Now, for the head, we already pre shaded this. So, we're going to hit this with a little bit of uh, Fantasy and Game Scale 75. All right, Arc Buckles Brown, which is a great purple. I mean, a really great purple. And I do like the purples because I believe that uh, they're in this death world and it's always cold. So there's not a lot of red in their skin and they're very pale and they have you know, very like almost purplish skin because of the cold, severe cold weather in which they live in. So there's a story into the skin tone which I'm using for these. And I do like that, um, that there is a story. Because I do like stories. <laughs> As you can tell, I like telling a lot of stories, you know? I mean, these space marines came from Fenris, and Fenris is a big part, a big part of uh, who they are and how they identify themselves. So these Primaris coming from somewhere that's not Fenris in order to fight with them, you know, I don't know how well received that is, and I hope that the new Codex comes and sheds some light on this. But like I'm saying, I think they need to be subservient to you know the status quo and the primaries need to prove themselves in order to get anywhere because um no they're not just going to come and dominate everything now logistically they say that they're more accurate that they're taller that they have all these kind of benefits with press primaris but um and that's all well and good but you know they don't have the instincts that a space wolf would have 
in my opinion. Like a space wolf relies on their scent around, and you could put them in a dark room. They don't rely on their eyes as much as they rely on their scent, on the feeling vibrations. Like they, they sense the, the darndest things. They have the sense of a wolf for crying out loud. If you want to cry out loud, like, oh, okay. All right. Um, so yeah, I do this uh, skin tones with the purples, and then I bring it to some Mephiston Red, and try to bring some reds in there. Now, I also use scale 75 scale color red, uh, ink tense red, to bring some reds to it as well, just to have some kind of color. I don't want an undead creature on my hands. So just a mixture of that intense red and the Arbuckle Brown um, makes it so that uh, there's some color, some blood going through the skin, but not, you know, a whole ton of it. So yeah, to be born of Fenris, you may ask, what is Fenris like? And the homeworld home world of the Space Wolves is dominated by extremes of climate, and amongst them, most deadly and turbulent worlds inhabited by man. Most of Fenris' surface is covered by water. It's Tiny land masses are no more than islands scattered sparsely upon the mighty sea. And one and only sizable, and the one and only sizable continent, Asheam, lies at the North Pole because it's just straight ice. Fenris follows an elliptical orbit around its pale sun. For much of the year long, long year, the world is a remote from even this feeble star, and its surface remains incredibly cold. The oceans freeze over as Fenris draws away from the sun, and at its furthest point, even the equatorial seas are covered with ice. And at the height of winter, a man can walk between the many islands upon Fenris which they dwell. Indeed, it is said that Sigrid tall climbed from the girdle of the world to the peaks of Ashlem in the far north, and that his mighty deed earned him a place in the hall of gods. Towards the end of the year, as the planet sweeps close to the sun once more, a brief spring warms the surface. At this time, the ice restraints retreats to the poles, and gargantuan dwellers of the deep emerge to enjoy the bounty of the sun sprawl krill and blade fish. At its closest point to the sun, the sub-oceanic crust of Fenris breaks and twists, exposing molten core to the icy waters. Blazing islands rise from the sea, spewing flame and lava. Lava. I like the word lava. Below the surface, the waters boil into streams and engulf Fenris and sulfurous fumes. Islands create, create in the upheaval of the process preceding years are cast into turmoil. Turmoil, I say. All right, time to use some blue gray. And this is for the beard, the moity moity beard. Some endure, but many are broken apart or swallowed by the sea, casting their inhabitants into the merciless deep. But the mighty rock of the tribesmen, known as Ashlam, stands fast, a single chainless land among a world of ruin and tournament, torment. It is said that in the time of making, the Allfather cast the spear into Fenris, to the Sea of Stars, reckoning it to be no place fit for life. Fenris felt the cold of the and dark, and ran back into the warmth of the wolf's eye. The heat of the eye protruded too great, and Fenris fled into the outer dark once again. It is each great year that Fenris races towards the sun in the summer, Flees again, plunging all into the cold embrace of winter. So seasons are hard. This is a death world. No, no life was ever meant to dwell there. 
You have savage seas and warring tribes and dwellers from the clouds. You have Kraken. It is just not a place meant to be hospitable by man. You have children, women, men thrive there. Then there's the initiation rites. Do the Primaris go through it? To the gate of Mordecai? Hmm. To get judged as harshly as other ones? Time for some ivory. And ivory is going to go as the first highlight for the beard. The white beard. There's a trial of the beast. Did the Primaris go through that as well? I'm sure they could. But it would be great to see and read like a book based on that. The Primaris going through the trials, earning their way into the Fang, earning their way into the great companies, not just being placed there. They can't be just placed there. They have to earn their way. Huh. I don't understand. I don't understand how Primaris can just plump their way into the space walls. I guess you can, but I like the lore. So you have 12 great companies. You used to have 13. You have the Blood Malls, the Sea Wolves, the Son of Mordecai, the Red Moons, the Champions of Fenris, the Death Wolves. You have the Storm Wolves, the Iron Wolves, the Drake Slayers, the Black Manes, the Fire Howlers, Grim Bloods, and finally the 13 company that was lost going to search for Russ. And finally, I'm going to Foundation White for the Extreme Highlights. You always highlight with the Extreme White. So yeah, we have 12 different great companies. Mine are the Black Mains. Uh, the one thing is, we have the Black Mains, which is great. But, <laughs> it's funny. Ragnar himself is just... <sighs> oh, Ragnar. Oh, Ragnar, Ragnar, Ragnar. His sculpt is absolutely horrendous. I wish they came up with a new one when they come up with new releases. So, all in all, it's a really fun build. Definitely fun build. Ragnar Blackmane is... I, I'm reading a book, the um, Space Wolves Omnibus. Oh my gosh, it's so good. Ragnar is such a good character. You know, Ragnar, I wish they come up with a new one because his story is epic. He's born from the Thunderfits tribe. Uh, Ragnar has always been touched by glory. As a child, he rang with the young warriors twice his age. And even as a youth, uh, his famous battle frenzies saw him reap frightening tally of rival tribes, menfolk. His audacity and fierce spirit made Ragnar a natural choice to join the ranks of the Sky Warriors. And after his discovery by the wolf prince priest, he left his tribe without backward glance. In fact, his tribe got decimated by another tribe. His tribe got decimated by another tribe, and actually it took him with a wolf priest. And he didn't look back. He didn't look back, although he had a girlfriend. <laughs> but he didn't look back. He, it tore him up a little bit. And oddly enough, the warring tribe that was warring that decimated his entire family and friends. Um, it's funny because he actually was partnered with him. He had to become, he eventually became his leader. You know, the, the, per, the one person that killed his, what he felt his family was. The one person had to become his brother. And that was tough. He's doing the trial of Mordecai, the Ragnar skills and resourcefulness came to the fore. As he roamed alone in the wilderness, Ragnar was hunted by the much feared black maned wolves. As dark and terrible as any night demon. Though it was many times his size, after a great struggle, Ragnar managed to kill the wolf beast with his bare hands. Through burning exhaustion, Ragnar hauled his carcass through the snowdrifts to the fang. This great deed was seen by the wolf priest as a good omen. 
and from that day forth Ragnar wore the black mane's pelt, pelt. And then it took it took it as his namesake. Ragnar's saga later tells of his elevation from the ranks of Blood Claws directly to the Wolf Guard, earning this rare promotion after butchering the orc warlord Borzad Khan as an entire routine in a frenzy rampage. Can you imagine taking down an entire orc warband? Wow, I can't. I can't see a primary was just doing that. That much passion, that much rage. Okay, time for shoulder pads. Uh, there we are. You can use different kind of yellows. I like to use this. Start with a layer of the Gazebo Skull. It's not Eagles on Scarlet. And yeah, I'm starting with um, a Uriel yellow. That's right. Uriel yellow. And this is what I use for the shoulder pads now. And that's that special shoulder pad that I got from the. Um, from the specialist pack, which is pretty cool. So this is the way I love to paint yellow now. I don't, yellow gets clunky on me, but through an airbrush, oh, it's a dream. It is a dream. So Ragnar quickly proved himself as a gifted leader of men as well as talented warrior. When his wolf lord, Beric Thunderfist, met his end in the daemon taint axe of the champion of corn ragnar led the hunt for his master's killer and took bloody vengeance ragnar was later appointed wolf lord in barracks stead a remarkable accomplishment for one so young i think the youngest actually ragnar has led the greek his great company with all the fury courage and youth ever since the warrior is proudly bearing his symbol, the black mane wolf, head as an armor of his title. That's right. All my men are, um, they're black manes after Ragnar. Still a pity that I don't. <laughs> it's a pity that I don't have a sculpt that I actually like that I want to paint from Ragnar, and I wish they did. I wish they did. So this is a fun, it's an interesting shoulder pad. Uh, I don't know where it's coming from. Time for some model color to black. I like using model color black because there's less sheen to it. Um, all the other blacks have a little bit of sheen to it and I'm not crazy about that. I'm not crazy about the satiny finish that they have in game color black. So I use model uh, color black just to eliminate that. All in all, this, this model was, oh man, this model is so much fun to build. I really enjoyed it and it's fitting at the centerpiece of my long fangs army and I could have done a lot of things with this leader like I could have done a wolf pack guard uh, wolf guard pack leader but in order to do that put a storm shield and a hammer on it it only has one wound so I didn't think it was worth it so you know I wanted to have some you know bang bang in case somebody came up but I figured go for the pew pew instead of the bang bang in other words, go for the all-out uh, shooting long distance, then going into anything close combat and just, you know, run them as just your far strikers uh, on the field. And, you know, what's cooler than having, you know, an RPG, holding an RPG and, you know, uh, that and holding LAS cannons and plasma cannons and it's just like... I could have done the heavy bolter, but the heavy bolters just don't have the reach as the plasma cannons and um, the the missile launcher or the las cannons. Especially the las cannons, they can reach just about across the board. And since I have the uh, Stormwolf uh, ship, attack ship, so and they have las cannons too. Essentially, I'm just doubling up on that with just very little cost. So when it comes to doing things efficiently on the field. Uh, a battle, you're gonna want to, you're gonna want a far striking unit 
and you want to pay as least points as possible. And if you got to pay, pay uh, play points, you got to spend points. If you got to spend points, then you got to spend it wisely uh, as a commander, as a general in your army. So you may want to take that in consideration. So that's the build that I went with. Each one of these can take anything from the heavy armor or anything. So I just went with it. Got the two LAS cannons. I have uh, the missile launcher for the leader. And then two plasma cannons. I think it just make a, a great suite. And uh, I'm going to do a tutorial of the LAS cannon bits. And I'll put the captain shield on top of him. And then going to do the RPG right now with uh, Vallejo model color. And so, yeah, I think that uh, doing the captain with an RPG was a wise choice because I had two LAS cannons in the box and I had two plasma cannons, which I really wanted to, and then all that was left, I mean, I could have had a plasma gun, but honestly, I've used a plasma gun on, you know, I, I spent the points and used the plasma gun for a uh, blood claw, for two blood claws in two packs, and um, I mean, they haven't done much for me, the plasma guns, like hardly anything at all, really, uh, damage wise. And I don't think I've even, like, if I hit once with them in all the times that I've played, that's a lot. You know, I just haven't really hit much with them. So I don't know. I'm not digging the plasma, the plasma uh, guns, you know, um, or the plasma pistols, to be honest with you. And power swords, oh man. If you have a choice between a power sword and a power fist, you'd get the power fist. I'm like, really? <laughs> power swords are like, eh. I really haven't done much with mine. Let's just put it that way. Like, every time I try to hit something with it, meh. Do I even hit? Not really. So, I think like I'm just um, I'm fighting a lot of high armored stuff. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, custodies are freakishly high ish um, when it comes to armor. All right, this, uh, this grenade launcher is looking good. Time for some edge highlighting. For edge highlighting, I'm going to use a mixture of that ink, and then I use foundation white, and then I use some flow aid and some water. And that combination right there really helps me edge highlight. Now, of course, you have to wick off the excess. Once you wick off the excess, you have no problem whatsoever getting it to flow onto the edges and doing the edge highlights and i like doing the white edge highlights on black and i think it looks kind of cool so you just need to be careful with it but once you're careful with it you're good to go and that's just the way it works and that's pretty cool so i'm excited i did this one um i did this one up and it came out really well the unit's coming together well. I'm still not done with it. I'm still working with a couple of things. I uh, put together the last cannon boys, and uh, there's gonna be a tutorial for that coming down the road uh, once I get to edit it all, because these videos take some time to edit for sure. Coming up with material to talk about during the videos, as well as coming up with uh, um, other things and keeping things on a schedule and always posting on Wednesdays and having something to come out on Wednesdays. It's kind of tricky, so I try to get as much done as possible. Plus, I have different kind of things going on, like uh, from trash to treasure, which is really cool. I have a lot of great ideas for it. I'm looking at some Ford World uh, reproduction pieces in order to get onto that Rhino. Um, and if you want to check that out, it's called From Trash to Treasure. It's one of my playlists that I have. Um, I'm starting more discussions on my channel. You know, kind of get the community involved with it as well. I want to have more aspects. I'm trying to get some... Um, I'm trying to get some giveaways that I'm going to do and some battle reports. I just finished a game table. Well, just about finished. It's playable. I could play on it. Not a problem, but it's not 100% secure. Let's do one more thing. I'm going to have a video about how I put together, uh, well, I say I, but my family members uh, and I helped put together this gaming table, which took the better part of a year and it's all handmade. And I had a couple of uh, battles on it and oh my gosh, it's it's beautiful. But I do need to have better lighting so I can do battle reports and bring them to the channel. There's a lot of things that I wanna do on this channel. That's for sure. 
Okay, so time to put the arms on, which I think are the most, most, most difficult part to put on uh, for these models. I do have the base here, and if you want to see the base, uh, I do have a basing tutorial, which I'm going to link up here above. So if you want to see how I do the base, I do not do it in this video. This video has already lasted over an hour, and I do want to just, you know, put another half hour onto the video, so it would be an hour and 45 minutes. So if you want to see the base, link up, uh, check that out. But this is the hardest part. So I put some glue and I held it into place, and that's when I started to modify it and bring it over, and I put some green stuff and gaps that were being filled. Like It really gave me a hard time uh putting this together like it really did and it was kind of frustrating and i hope that when they do the new models that it's not going to be as frustrating uh if they do new models with the new release which i really think they did well okay guys it was really a pleasure to have this time with you and i'm looking forward to seeing more tutorials and discussions and more stuff on the channel i have a lot of planned for this channel and a lot uh to offer for you guys so i'm really happy you came and watched this video in fact i'm honored that you did uh, i don't think too highly of my own stuff but uh i'm my worst critic so all right well uh, let's see the pictures of the finished model with the base later This thing's so cool, it's ice cold. Well, I hope you liked this video, and if you like this video, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time on the Miniatures Paintbrush.